Um, today's message is fantasy or faith. It's apologetic look at faith. Now, uh, a few weeks ago, about four or five weeks ago, uh, I spoke on apologetics here in the church. And I want to tell you about apologetics now. It's not going to build huge churches. If you want to build a huge church, you preach that everybody's going to get well and everybody's going to get rich and everybody's going to, you know, that Jesus is going to do all those things and the churches grow. But, uh, and you're going to get better, all of those things. But uh, apologetics is a theological thought. It is not an apology for being a Christian. The word means in defense of Christianity. And so today's message will be on defense. And again, this, this idea doesn't build big churches, but it builds big lives for Jesus. It gives us depth in our life and in our faith. And so today we're, we're already past the elementary. Let's talk about the elementary questions. The first one is, where did life come from? So about three or four weeks ago, again, I spoke on this. Where did life come from? You either believe that it came out of a pool of, um, of um, protein and lightning struck it and all of a sudden life happened on, in this universe, in this earth. Or you believe uh, Richard Dawkins, uh, who, who is a famous atheist, you believe that uh, some alien passed through and left a seed here on earth and this all happened. And he doesn't really care. He's just here and gone. Even in that thought, though, there's some sort of superior being in there. And, uh, or you, I don't know, there's a myriad of, of theories on how life began here. We happen to be Christians. I happen to be a Christian, a real believer in God. So I believe that God created life, that God started life. Now, that's as good as any alien I've heard about that's not a provable fact either. And that's as good as any pool of protein with a lightning strike that we can't replicate so far. It can't be done so far. So my thought that God had a big bang theory of his own and created the earth is at least as good as any of those, not to be something ashamed of. So the next question would have been, um, is there a God? Is there a superior being of some time? You may not be God, but just a superior being, some superior intellect. And, and today I'm going to quote from uh, Flew, who is a famous atheist, and we're going to talk about the intellectual side of God. So you look at that. It is, uh, is there a superior being? And then the next question would be, if there's a superior being, does he care? Or did he just walk off? Like Richard Dawkins, a Alien came in, left a seed, and just walked off. He didn't care. He didn't have anything else to do, whatever. I don't know exactly. But did he care? And if he cares, the next question would be, if he cares, how would he communicate to us? How would he tell us that he cares? So those are the elementary questions of apologetics. If you take a class on apologetics, you'll go through some of those. Greatest apologetic in the world was the Apostle Paul brilliant man. Uh, when he goes, when he writes the New Testament, you'll, you'll pick up his thought, his, uh, uh, and, and he was just genius at it. Uh, for me, the greatest apologetic uh, person in my life would have been C.S. Lewis, who died a long time ago, but I got his book, Mere Christianity. And for me, he is a great apologist, um, so if you read, if you start on Mere Christianity with C.S. Lewis, remember to bring a dictionary with you. It is not light reading. It is very strong reading. At 17 now, at 17, I was making some decisions. You know, if you've been in Christianity very long, you get this. You come to a place where somebody says to you, well, you just need to bypass your mind. Just shoot it someplace. Let it go someplace and just believe. Now, I'm telling you, I never could do that. I wanted to know why. And I'm going to talk to you about that today. I want to know who. I want to know. And I want it to be settled in my head. And so at 17, when I was making decisions on where I was going to go with my life. I had a, a scholarship that I could have taken. I had a couple of other ideas that I, I was toying with. Um, an older friend of mine who was a pastor, but very much a genius, 
Bracey handed me Mere Christianity, and Bracey said to me, you can read this. This is written for you and someone like you. And at 17, I began to read C.S. Lewis. Powerful moment for me, because it decided for me the rest of my life. Those, that one year, that one year in study decided for me where I would go to school, what I would decide when I got married. Uh, all of those things for me were decided there. What I would believe about Jesus. So, again, I had a mind. God gave it to me. I must use it for him. So, let's look at some of the things here now. Um, in the last one, I know this showed up on the video, so I know I said it wrong in here. But the atheist that we were talking about was, uh, I said, free, and his name is really Flu, Anthony Flu, and I'm sorry that I, I messed that up. I apologize in all the other three services, too, but I don't know whether I got it wrong there or not. But I know I got it wrong on this video, so... <laughs> So when I went back and looked, oh, my goodness. Anyway, here's Anthony Flew. Now, as an older man, very genius, very smart, as an older man, he was invited to look at DNA because he, he was smart. And so they decided, you need to look at this with us. And he began to look at DNA when he was in his late 80s and 90s. And in his studies, he decided that there was a superior being of some po so sort a superior intellect in the universe. And, and he did this looking at DNA. And all his friends, now he's older, all his friends said to him, you've gone senile, you've lost your mind, you know that isn't true, you've been an atheist all your life, and now all of a sudden you say you believe in God. He said, well, I can't go that far. I, I didn't become Christian, I didn't become Muslim, I didn't become any religious that I know of. He said, I, I just look at this and I'm a... I'm a I want to follow truth wherever it takes me. And I realized that there's something more than just what I know. There's a superior intellect in the universe someplace. Listen to what he writes. Listen to what he writes here. With the insight of Einstein and other noted scientists that there had to be an intelligence beyond the integrated complexity of the physical universe and my own insight the integrated complexity of life itself, which is far more complex than the physical universe, can only be explained in the terms of an intellectual source. It has to be somebody smarter than us doing this. Now, all of you guys will get it. Some of you will get it. Some of you will get it. Some of you will get it. But all of you guys should get this. It has to do with video game. If you play a video game, it's just that simple. Or watch a video on your computer or on your phone. If you play a video game, you'll see that there are certain patterns at each level when you're playing this game. And you get used to that pattern and you can start winning the game. Now, some of you need to try this as an intellectual exercise. Just play a game on your phone. But anyway, you're not laughing. This is supposed to be funny. <coughs> But anyway, you're playing this game, and you see these patterns. And then you go to the next level, and the patterns get a little more intricate, but it's still patterns. You go to the next level, patterns are intricate. You may change characters. All of these things take place on this game, and everybody sees the pattern. I mean, eventually, if you play the game long enough, you figure out the pattern, and you play the game, and you win the prize, whatever it is. But there's more to it than that. In the early days of the computer, we had to write ASCII text. Uh, ASCII text would be uh, writing in, in programmable language for an IBM computer at the time. And you write the ASCII text out, and as you write it out, it does certain things. A bat file would start automatically a, a, just a program. You, you, or you could create one where you had to answer questions, and the person had to answer a question, and then the next question came up in the next one. And if you missed the language or the code, that was written there, if you missed it, it didn't work right. And you had to go back and redo the code. This is what Anthony Flew saw. All of us can see patterns. But what he saw when he looked at DNA, he saw that it wasn't patterns. It wasn't patterns at all. It was a code written, just like you'd write programming for a computer. And he goes, uh oh, 
no longer patterns, no longer tendencies, no longer any of these things. It's code written. And to write this kind of code, it has to be a superior intellect for who we are. We cannot write this kind of code. There's no possibility we'd ever get right because of all the billions of variables. We would never get it right. And so he thought, oh, intellectual source. Still not a Christian. So all of us can see the patterns, but many of us don't see the codes. And today I want to talk to you about what God has done. I was speaking, um, you know, I taught school for a long time, and, um, and we were invited by a family to come out and to eat supper with them. They were going to start a fundraiser, and their daughter was in one of my math classes, and so, I, I, you know, they invited Twyla and I out to the house, and they lived out here on Dam Site Road. Love that name. But anyway, Dam Site Road, which is just below the dam. And, um, and so, um, uh, you know, I had a friend... This is not part of the sermon. Do y'all mind? You know how your mind does stupid things? Well, this, I have a friend who's a Pentecostal pastor, and he owned an acre of land on Damsite Road. And I just thought a neat name would be Damsite Better Pentecostal Church. Wouldn't that be? <laughs> I just thought it was good. You know, he didn't think so. He sold the property and bought another piece. But nevertheless, I just thought it was good. Um, now, where was I? See, this is the hard part of this, getting back. Ah, that thought's gone. But anyway, so we're, we're looking at uh, uh, these patterns, and, and everybody can see the pattern. People can't see the coding. So I was talking to this, young, this family. I went out to visit them, and I was talking to the, the young lady who was in my class, and all of a sudden, a sister that I didn't know she had came up. And this sister, I began to talk to her. Twyla and I were both speaking to her. We were cordial with everybody in the room. But this girl, I decided, I found out she had a child and there was no husband. So I asked, and what do you plan to do with your life? How are you going to do this? Her family was pretty wealthy. She said, oh, I'm going to be a brain surgeon. Really? I nearly laughed. But then it was sort of sad. I said, well, what are you going to do for your education? She said, well, by the end of this year, I want to have my GED. Really? Uh, what about college? Well, yeah, I, I don't know yet. Now, you think that with me. I would love to tell you a wonderful story about a person who was nothing and became a brain surgeon. But I can't because the last time I saw her, she had another child and was still working on her GED. Now, all that stuff, I said to her, what, what, why do you want to be a brain surgeon? She said, people tell me all the time, I can be anything I want to be. She was not a dumb person. I can be anything I want to be, and I can do anything I want to do, so therefore I just decided I want to be a brain surgeon. Now, this is the philosophy of our age. If you confess it long enough, and if you believe it strong enough, you can do and be anything. Now, I hate to tell you guys this, but that's not true. That doesn't work. You don't create money. You don't create wealth. You don't create job. Just by believing only, there's more to it than that. So when someone comes along and talks to you about faith, it is not just believing that Jesus existed. Not just having a happy feeling about God one day, and all of a sudden you're a Christian. That doesn't make you a Christian at all. There's more to it than that. It's more to it than just saying it, I believe in Jesus. More to it in your life than that. And in the next two weeks, we'll go over this. But today, we're going to talk about faith from a biblical sense now, I want you to listen to the Scriptures. This is Hebrews. And if you want to study during the week, I suggest that you read this chapter in Hebrews. This is called the chapter of faith or uh, the hall of faith, many people call it, because it lists people who have done great things for God through faith. So, let's read this together. It's uh, the beginning. Hebrews 11, 1 through 3. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, 
the evidence of things not seen, for by it the elders obtained a good testimony. Listen, listen to that first part again. I'm not going to read the whole thing again. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So if I wanted to talk to you about substance, it would be something that you could touch or feel with your hand. Is that correct? Substance would be like this. It would be something you could see, something you could touch. And evidence, if I wanted to talk to you about evidence, most of the evidence in the Scripture is a firsthand look at what happened. It's firsthand testimony. In, in court, this, you could take something like this to court and read it into evidence because it was an eyewitness account to what happened in the New Testament. So when we talk about substance, it's real stuff that you can feel. And when we talk about evidence, we're talking about this idea of testimony. I have a testimony to tell you. I have something to say. This is how it affected me. Get those two points now. Something I can touch, something that's evident. This is faith. Evidence of things not seen. In other words, um, there's, I can touch this, but there's more to it that I can't see. There's evidence that this happened, but there's more to it that I can't see yet. But because this is true, I know the next step is true too. See, that's, that's the beginning of faith. Now, let's go on. I want to use, um, use the life of David. So I'm going to talk to you out of the Old Testament. I'm going to make it real short because don't, you don't have three hours to listen to me banter on. But if you want to read this, this is in 1 Samuel or 1 Chronicles. A part of it's in 2 Chronicles. But you'll get the story this way. And when you're reading it, um, this is only on the life of David. So let's talk about David. He was about 13, 14 years old. May have been younger than that. I'm not for sure. And God had re re rejected Saul as king of Israel. Saul had done some weird things, and God didn't care for that, and so he was not going to be king. In other words, his son wasn't going to be the next king. And God sent Samuel, the prophet, to David's father's house, and he said, out of the sons that are there is going to be the next king, and I want you just to have them line up and pass, and I'll show you which one I want. So he got there, the man land, lined up all his sons, and Samuel went past them each one. I don't know whether he asked them questions like an interview. I don't know how he did it, but, but none of them fit. And he said, well, let's do this again. So the man again lined up his sons, and Samuel went through them again. And he said, no, there's something wrong here. This, none of them fit. None of them are God's choice. Is there something missing? And David's father went, Oh, it's the little one, the ruddy one. We need to bring him in. He's out herding sheep. Can you imagine that your daddy would forget you? Or that your mama would forget you? Some do, you know. God never forgets. So they bring David in. And sure enough, it's him, the little one. And he anoints him with oil. And he says, there's another king. So I don't want you to tell anybody about what happened today. So we don't have a battle here. In the next scene of David's life, we see him taking a lunch or food to his brothers who are fighting a battle. He was still too young to fight. So no one in Israel expected him to fight the battle, but his older brothers were all there. And so they took mama's cooking, which would be fun if you were a soldier all alone, and, and he took it to his brothers. And while he's there on the other end of the valley comes out this huge man, big giant. And you know the story of David and Goliath. He hollers across the valley and it echoes, send me a man. Let a man come, fight me. And if he wins, you take us. But if I win, I take you and no one dies. But the man who comes. Well, when he started hollering this, he did it a couple times a day. When he started hollering this over the valley, all of Israel, it means the whole army, including David, begin to scramble for the caves and shelter, fearful of their lives. And they ran away, including David. Now, listen to this very carefully. He ran away. 
And while they're running, somebody begins to tell him, you know what the man gets who goes out there and fights? What does he get? Well, he gets to white, ride the white horse. The king's white horse? Yes, the king's white horse. Does he get anything? Else? Oh, yeah, he gets to marry the king's daughter. The king's daughter? Well, this sort of fits in with me becoming king, doesn't it? You know, he, David's thinking this thought. You can see his faith building. Well, what else does he get? Well, he gets tax-free land. Wow. And he gets to live in the king's palace. Oh, this is the king. I got it. I see a plan here. I see it coming together. So David starts talking to his brothers. I can kill that giant. I can do this. The Lord, with the Lord's help, I can do this. I can get this done. And finally, his brother said, okay, we'll take you to the king because you're not going to shut up otherwise. This is our brother. He's the little one, the ruddy one. That's You know, we got him herding sheep. I don't know what he's, but he wants to fight Goliath. He wants to fight Goliath, so we brought him here. So Saul, who was bigger than any man in Israel, it says, he wasn't a giant, but he was big. He wasn't big like Goliath, but he was still good-looking, tall. He takes out his armor, and he puts it on David, and, of course, is built for a man, and he's just a boy. And when he does, he can't move with the weight. He can't carry the armor around, and he says, that ain't going to work. Well, what evidence... What substance do you have, son? He didn't use those words, but it's the same thing. What makes you think that you can kill this giant? Well, one day I was herding my daddy's sheep, and out of the, out of the bushes came a wolf to kill the sheep. Now listen to the evidence and the substance here. He said, and I took this sling right here in a rock, and I whirled it around and killed that wolf before he could take, take any of the sheep. Okay, well, that sounds like a good story. What else you got? Well, one day I was there, and, and, and out came a bear out of the woods to steal the sheep. And, well, I took this sling and this rock and, and killed that bear. Anything else? Oh, yeah, yeah. One day a lion came out of the woods. Anyway, whatever the evidence and substance that he gave when he told this story was so powerful to the king said, all right, no army, you're going to walk out there with your sling and I got nothing to lose. Nobody else will fight the man, not even me. So you go out there and you do this. And now you know the story. You know, he slung the sling around. Goliath steps up and he goes, what an insult. You send this baby out to fight with me. What is wrong with you people? And then David killed him. And that's the way the story goes. But you can see the building of faith here. What evidence do you have? What substance do you have in your life? What's going on in your life that, that you know that you can do this? That you have faith. There's substance and evidence already in your life that God has called you, that he is using you, that he's going to use there. There is substance and evidence, and you start lining it up and thinking through it logically and intellectually, and your faith will build. If you have nothing else to build it on, then Hebrews 11 is for you because it goes through all these people's names and sometimes tells a little story or you have to go in the Old Testament and find the story of who they were and what God did through them, and you'll see what God can do through you with evidence and substance. This is what faith is. It is not you forgetting to think or blowing your mind away or not paying any attention at all. It is not, um, it is calculated. It is, it is thought through and thorough in you that you know that God has called you and that God can do this through you. Whatever it is he's called you to. This is who he is. Now, I'm going to quit. The next two weeks, I'm going to go over some more of these principles like this of faith. But I'm going to stop today because twilight is already going. My watch working, whatever. We're getting long. But this is what we're talking about now. We're not talking about you mindlessly doing stupid stuff in the name of God. But we're talking about 
really making and giving your life to him. Let's uh, pray together. Wow. We step in your presence and we hear your word and we think through it and your spirit leads and guides us and we're thinking all these thoughts all of a sudden. Again, some of the dreams we had as children and we're watching you line up things in our life and oh, well, you did do that for me. Oh, this happened. Oh, you are the God of the universe and oh my goodness, my life can be so much more for you if I just had faith. That evidence and substance. God, you called us deeper and farther than we've ever been, wherever be, way beyond our imagination can imagine. This is your calling in our life. We ask you to touch us, challenge us by your Holy Spirit, and keep us strong in you. Amen. Thank you for watching. If you want more information about our church ministries, come and visit us at 67 and a half April Wind South, Highway 105 in Montgomery, Texas, or call our church office at 936-588-2832. You can visit our website at www.aprilsound.org or follow us on social media. April Sound Church, a family-friendly community church.